Welcome back to Black Cat Crypto Club. What is going on with Bitcoin? Just Friday, we were about to push through 72,000. This morning, we dropped into the 66,000s. So what is going on? What's making the price, price go down? Guys, honestly, I'm just going to come right out and say it. I wouldn't be surprised if we see a big rebound tomorrow. So we're going to get into all of that and a bunch more stuff that's going on. So stick around. But as always, guys, if you have a few bucks, please go over and help the animals over here at For Them Animal Sanctuary. This is their web page. And I do leave that link in the description of all of my videos this month. Um, but it is also for them, Animal Sanctuary, for being the number four, um, for them, animal, or sorry, for them, sanctuary.org. Now you can see right here on their front page, you can go down and their PayPal is right there. You can also go over to their Patreon and help them out that way. Or you can just go over to their social media and show them some love there as a way of support. So go over and help them out. This is the best cause out there right now guys so go over and help these animals out these uh needy and um abused and abandoned animals over here in sanctuary now um this is also a 501c nonprofit, so it also helps you out when it comes tax time okay so let's get into what's going on with bitcoin if you guys have been watching my videos for long, you may have noticed that we're always doing this kind of video every six weeks or so right before an FOMC, Federal Reserve, rate meeting. Because the markets always get really delicate and scared right before the Federal Reserve meets and decides whether or not to cut or hate hike rates. And yes, tomorrow, Wednesday, we have an FOMC interest rate decision. So that is definitely a big part of what is going on with this drop. Now, what is the Fed likely to do tomorrow? I'm going to jump over to the Fed Watch tool. Um, let me zoom in on this a little bit for you. Now, what this says is that there is a 95.1% chance that rates remain the same at 5.25 to 5.5%. There's a 4.9% that we see a rate cut. And effectively on here, it's showing that there is no chance that we see a rate height. Okay. So as you can see right there, the market is expecting overwhelmingly that the rates, uh, that rates will stay the same. Now, here's the big catch. On Friday, we saw, um, we saw the market react to jobs data. And in my opinion, the market reacted, uh, reaction was unfounded. And I reported this. Now, if you watched my video on the subject, you'll know that a lot of the headlines in the media signaled that the economy was strong because of these jobs numbers. But when you actually dug into the numbers, you actually saw that it shows that the economy is weakening and that unemployment is rising. So both of these things, along with manufacturing data that we've seen coming out the last week or so, GDP data, and just about every other indicator out there are signaling that the economy is starting to falter and that rate cuts should be starting uh, in the near future. Now, the market didn't react that way. No thanks to the media, as I said. Um, but I think anyone with, you know, two brain cells could have looked at the raw data, the numbers that were in this job, jobs report, and put two and two together, so to speak. But apparently a lot of people 
just don't have the required equipment. And there's a lot of people out there, there apparently, that make investment decisions based on headlines, unfortunately. So I actually think tomorrow's FOMC meeting is actually going to be very interesting. I think the, F, uh, the, the Federal Reserve wants to, um, if they want to surprise people, this would be the meeting to cut rates. Now, is that likely? I am not sure. I don't know. The market is definitely pricing in no rate rate cut tomorrow, as we've seen. Uh, but we've also seen the market being wrong about those economic data that just came out. So we know that Powell isn't stupid. You know, we're I I guarantee you Powell isn't going to look at the jobs data and make the same conclusions that the market did. You know, he is going to dig, he and the Federal Reserve Board are going to dig into those numbers and they're going to know what's going on. And we know that the Federal Reserve wants to cut, cut rates, guys, because the banking system is starting to show cracks. So it'll be interesting to see what they do. Now, my prediction is that they leave rates the same, but... I'd be surprised if Powell doesn't come out in his speech afterwards and correct everyone about their uh, about the labor data. Um, so I'll be watching for that. Anything he has to say about those labor uh, data and the jobs numbers. And um, I wouldn't be surprised if he comes out very dovish and signals that rate cuts are coming very soon. Now, the reason I say all of this is that we've seen many other central banks around the world beginning to cut rates. And we know that the banking system here in the U.S. is starting to show cracks, like I said. But I don't think Powell wants the chaos and the pandemonium of absolutely coming out tomorrow and surprising everyone and cutting rates. So I think tomorrow he'll come out and he'll kind of signal that you know, as kind of a heads up that rate cuts are coming very soon, maybe by the end of July, um, which would be their next meeting. Uh, I believe their next meeting is the 22nd or 20 something of July. Now, I don't have a crystal ball, so this is purely speculation, but this is kind of what I see likely um, with all the puzzle pieces coming in around it. That's kind of where my, my mind is at. Uh, now, the second thing that I want to kind of go over is that there are a lot of people out there um, that I've seen lately that are blaming the drop that we had on Friday instead of on the jobs numbers, like I reported. A lot of people are coming out and saying that it's, it's all Roaring Kitty's fault because Roaring Kitty had his live stream on Friday. And guys, yes, it was the bigger news in a weird way. Like, Roaring Kitty definitely took all of the thunder out of pretty much every other story on Friday. But it doesn't mean it wasn't the only news, guys. They, we did have that jobs number. But people blaming... Roaring Kitty, in my opinion, is pretty ridiculous. You know, Roaring Kitty, in all actuality, has nothing to do with Bitcoin. Um, so blaming him for Bitcoin dropping on Friday is, in my opinion, pretty ridiculous. But there's a lot of people saying that he came out and the, the whole live stream that Roaring Kitty did was a complete fail and that he didn't even talk about GameStop. He just came out and said a bunch of nonsense and drank a beer and, you know, whatever, which just isn't the case, okay? First of all, you know, he did talk about GameStop. <laughs> he did talk about GameStop in that live stream. And what he said 
in my opinion, is pretty bullish for Bitcoin. And that's why I'm going to bring this up here. Um, Cause if you really look into what he's saying, I think it's, it's actually pretty, it could have pretty positive implications for Bitcoin. Now, what he said was that GameStop had a legacy business and that legacy business was selling physical games um, in a brick and mortar store. You know, this, we all know what GameStop is and that's what their legacy business is, which is dying, unfortunately. And this is why we see a lot of hedge funds shorting GameStop. But, you know, the reason this is dying is that the world is becoming more and more digital and it's cheaper for console makers, PlayStation and Xbox, to build consoles without disk drives. And thus, the need for physical stores to sell physical game products is declining. But what Roaring Kitty said was that Ryan Cohen, the head of GameStop, will be will soon be re reinventing the business. Now, what that means, nobody really knows. But I want to jump over to an idea that did come out that I think is actually pretty logical. Uh, let me jump over here. Now, this says GameStop could start the biggest Bitcoin adoption story of the year with this move. Now, what this article suggests is that um, one quick way to transform the business of GameStop would be for GameStop to adopt the Bitcoin standard and start buying Bitcoin with their reserves, just like MicroStrategy did, okay? Michael Saylor and MicroStrategy saved a dying business by buying, all they did was buy Bitcoin. And they took that dying business and made billions off of it, okay? <laughs> now, guys, as I've said before, with these Bitcoin ETFs, a lot more companies were going to start copying the what MicroStrategy did. And since we have seen several companies do exactly that, we've seen MetaPlanet, um, a company in Japan, uh, do that with their stocks and it soared, their stocks soared overnight. Now we saw just a few weeks ago, Similar Scientific, a company here in the US, do the same exact exact thing and their stock over the last two weeks since they did this is up 60 percent okay <laughs> no small amount um and then just yesterday we saw a canadian uh company do the same exact thing now i'm going to jump over to this article says yet another public company buys Bitcoin. Now, this is a company um, called DeFi Technologies. And these guys are very much into Web3 development. So this is an obvious play for them, but the effects are no different because guys, their stock <laughs> in the last 24 hours has gone up 40% in one day, 40%. That, guys, that is pretty much unheard of in traditional finance, in stocks. If your stock is jumping 40% in one day, that company is doing something majorly right. Okay, so this is an obvious, obvious easy way that, that GameStop could reinvent their business. And so I don't know if this is specifically what Roaring Kitty was suggesting with GameStop, but it wouldn't surprise me at all. So I don't know, guys, we'll, we'll have to kind of wait and kind of watch and see what, what GameStop does and how they, they move forward. 
Um, but it wouldn't surprise me at all. So now the next thing that I think we need to get back into is the topic that I covered just a few days ago in my last video. And that is Saudi Arabia going off of the pet petrodollar. Now you'll remember in my last video that Sunday was the deadline for Saudi Arabia to renew the petrodollar deal with the United States. Guys, I was really, really, really hoping that this wasn't true, you know, secretly, uh, where I couldn't find a lot of mainstream reporting, like I said in my last video, I was, I was really hoping, hoping that this was just, you know, the conspiracy uh, rumor mill on the internet just churning out some BS. Um, but this happened. Saudi Arabia's prince announced that they would not be renewing this petrodollar contract. Now, I'm going to jump over to this article. Um, it says Saudi Arabia's petrodollar exit, a global finance paradigm shift. Now, the reason this is so important is that without the petrodollar, the US dollar is much more at risk of losing the world reserve status. Now, in my previous video, I wasn't sure if Saudi Arabia was a part of BRICS or not. So I Googled it and this is what came up with, with Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates as members, BRICS countries produces about 40% or 44% of the world's crude oil. Interesting that just searching is Saudi Arabia part of BRICS, it brings up this whole thing about crude oil. So it might be important, guys. <laughs> but anyways, so Saudi Arabia is definitely part of BRICS, and it just seems that this is very much part of BRICS's uh, de-dollarization efforts. Now, guys, the U.S. is not going to give up the dollar being the world reserve currency without a fight, uh, because that would be a huge hit to our economy and would lead, uh, could lead, I won't say would, because again, guys, I don't have a crystal ball, but that this could lead to hyperinflation of the dollar. So I wouldn't be surprised if the U.S. declares liberation on a BRICS country uh, just as a way of, you know, muscling them into submission and throwing our weight around a little bit. Seems like the way we kind of like to address things. Um, and yes, that declaring liberation uh, comment is kind of a jab at both of the Bush administration's Operation Iraqi Liberation, which ironically uh, is a <laughs> acronym for oil. Okay, guys, just a little joke there. But um, anyways, guys, I want to jump over to another thing that this just happened late last month. Um, and this is Biden released 1 million barrels of gasoline from Northeast Reserve in a bid to lower prices at the pump. Now, when I first saw this, I was actually pretty appalled because it seemed to me that Biden was using our emergency oil reserves as an election play. You know, if, if, you are able to reduce prices at the gas station, people are generally going to think you're doing a great job. And coincidentally, it comes right before the election. You know, we didn't see Biden freeing up oil reserves last year, last summer. Um, so it, it seemed very suspect to me. 
And I thought, how irresponsible of Biden to use our emergency oil reserves to get reelected. However, with all of this news with Saudi Arabia and the petrodollar, I'm not so sure this, that this wasn't, um, you know, all of this news wasn't seen coming from the White House and that this, this move wasn't actually a message being sent to Saudi Arabia and OPEC. Because if we free up a bunch of oil reserves, price of oil goes down and this actually hurts Saudi Arabia and OPEC. So, you know, honestly, I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised if we aren't already in an oil war. You know, something to think about. Now, guys, I want to jump over to another clip um, from Andre Jeek. And I showed a bit of a clip from one of his previous videos on China. Uh, but this one specifically deals with the petrodollar and Saudi Arabia going off of this deal. Um, and I just think, you know, he did a really good job in this video of showing kind of what this means. So we're going to jump over to this, uh, this clip from Andre. Listen in. We export the biggest military in the world, but arguably the biggest export that the United States has by far are U.S. dollars. We aid a lot of countries with a lot of money. By design, we are the world's biggest money exports. So the question is, how does being able to export dollars help the U.S. economy? And the answer is, it helps in every single way imaginable. Because having the petrodollar system has created a demand around the world for other countries to buy our dollars and our treasury bonds, because that's how the U.S fuels its growth by issuing this debt, these treasury bonds that other people buy. It's also created a stable economy, lower interest rates, and liquidity in financial markets. And this has been hugely beneficial for the US stock market through higher stock prices and investment flows. Without the ability to export dollars, that would mean bad things. Let me show you an analogy using a balloon because this is the US economy in its normal state. And whenever there's a problem, we can just pump the balloon full of money to solve the problem, which also creates inflation, and it looks like this. Now, if I pump this balloon with enough inflation, eventually those rising prices would cause the economy to break because consumers wouldn't be able to afford anything. So eventually, with enough air, with enough money, the economy would break. Now, lucky for us, we have an exit valve right here. That means we can release the pressure and the dollars to the rest of the world and the world would actually absorb it because it also needs those dollars to buy its energy. But what happens when you have a balloon that keeps on expanding and doesn't have an exit valve? Eventually, that balloon would pop. Now that's just an analogy, but what does it really mean? Believe it or not, we've seen what it means because it's happened to other countries. Greece is on the verge of default tonight, hours from what many believe is a near certainty. Things like this are playing out across the country. The UN says food prices tripled last year and estimates four in five Syrians now live below the poverty line. Since 2019, the Lebanese pound has lost more than 90% of its value. Basic commodity prices have almost doubled. Argentina's annual inflation reached more than 100% in February. This is the first time since 1991 it's been in triple digits. So his costs go up whenever the value of the South Sudanese pound falls against the US dollar. That is what happens when there is no release valve. Now, Andre goes, on in this video and says that he doesn't think that anything is really going to change in actuality because kind of like that Yahoo Finance article that I showed you guys in the last video, he believes that the US is too strong and the dollar is too strong to lose the world reserve currency spot during our lifetime. 
I, on the, uh, the other hand, am not so sure. You know, yes, the dollar and the U.S. have been the strongest for my entire life. But there, guys, there are way too many puzzle pieces starting to fall into place, and I don't like the picture that is emerging. You know, I just don't think, I, you know, I think there's too many things happening for things to stay the same. You know, there's every reaction, you know, kind of causes a reaction. And so something has to give. Now, I've already said that the two likely outcomes from this are that we either see a war. Now, whether that being an all out actual war or a trade war, nobody really knows, right? Um, or the second possibility is that the US economy takes a hit and we possibly see hyperinflation hit the dollar. Now, guys, you know, hyperinflation by definition is is kind of all at once. You know, we see something strong, you know, the US dollar going at this 2% inflation for years and years and years and years, hundred, like what, we've been on a hundred years of 2% inflation or so. If hyperinflation hits, it's going to be, you know, it's going to break all at once and the dollar will be useless in an instant. And that's how hyperinflation works. So guys, I'm not trying to be an alarmist, but, you know, saying that everything is just going to stay the same when all of these pieces are falling into, into line, I think is, is a little irresponsible. <laughs> so, you know, no matter what happens, there is no denying that the U S is more risky to be in than it was last week. And I think conversely that Bitcoin is less risky uh, to be in just because of all of this news. Now, this is kind of the bad news that is good for Bitcoin in a way. And, uh, you know, by no means am I saying that the US dollar is going to fail and that there is absolutely going to be hyperinflation, you know, and we're going to see it very soon. That is not what I'm saying. Uh, all I'm saying is that there is more risk to the dollar than there was just a few days ago. And because of that, I think everybody should probably reevaluate their risk tolerances along these lines. You know, that's all I'm saying. So now again, you know, obviously no crystal ball here. <laughs> And nobody knows where things are actually going to end up. But let me know what you guys think in the comments. Uh, is, is there another option out there that I'm not seeing where everything is just candy canes and jelly beans? Let me know because I would really like to sleep at night. <laughs> and, you know, if there is, I would really love to believe that there is a positive outcome from this. So if I'm not seeing something that maybe maybe you have this concept of how we make it out of this without any of that other chaos, let me know in the comments. As always, guys, thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, if you liked anything in this video, please subscribe and share with anybody that you think that needs to hear this information. Um, also, uh, you know, remember to go over to, uh, for them animal sanctuaries guys, help them out. The link is in the description. Remember to stay humble and stack sats and I will see you guys in the next video.